Welcome to Professionalism and Customer Service in the Healthcare Environment, Ethical and Diversity Issues Related to Communication and Customer Service. This is Lecture B, Diversity Issues. In this lecture, we explore the benefits of diversity, ways to promote an inclusive work environment, common cultural differences, and disability etiquette. Cultural competency in the healthcare workplace is also discussed. The objectives for Lecture B, Diversity Issues, are to identify different dimensions of diversity, discuss the value of diversity, describe ways to promote an inclusive work environment, identify common cross-cultural differences, describe ways to communicate effectively with individuals with disabilities, and discuss key elements of cultural competency in healthcare. Diversity has multiple dimensions. Those that are most discussed include age, gender, race, ethnicity, and culture. Examples of other dimensions are education level, sexual orientation, physical ability, socioeconomic status, and religion. There are also differences related to less immediately apparent characteristics, such as personality, values, interests, and approaches to work or problem solving. Often when individuals find common ground in these types of areas, differences in more superficial characteristics, such as age and gender, recede into the background. In this lecture, we'll focus on some basic tips for working effectively across differences. We are all aware of the increasing racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity of the U.S. population. U.S. Census data clearly illustrate the nation's changing racial and ethnic diversity. According to the 2010 Census, more than half of the growth in the total population of the United States between 2000 and 2010 was due to the increase in the Hispanic population. Racial and ethnic minorities constitute approximately one-third of the population. According to a 2015 census report, quote, around the time the 2020 census is conducted, more than half of the nation's children are expected to be part of a minority race or ethnic group. This proportion is expected to continue to grow so that by 2060, just 36% of all children, people under age 18, will be single-race, non-Hispanic, white, compared with 52% today, end quote. In some states, such as Hawaii, New Mexico, California, Texas, and the District of Columbia, minorities already represent over 50% of the population. The percentage of foreign-born Americans was 13% in 2014 and expected to increase to 19% by 2060. Increasing diversity means that healthcare organizations will have a more diverse workforce and patient population. Diversity is commonly recognized as having a positive impact on organizations. A 2014 article about diversity notes that a Forbes Insights study, quote, identified workforce diversity and inclusion as a key driver of internal innovation and business growth, end quote. The author also references supporting literature. A McKinsey Quarterly article reports statistics showing that companies with diverse executive boards enjoy higher earnings, and the Harvard Business School reports that multiculturalism promotes creativity. The challenge is for organizations to create environments in which all individuals feel valued and which have cohesive, high-functioning teams. What actions can organizations take to create an inclusive work environment that provides a good foundation for cohesive groups? Organizations can explicitly include diversity as a core organizational value and conduct diversity training sessions for employees. They can also examine their own hiring and promotion practices to ensure that they are equitable and that particular groups aren't being excluded in any way. What can you as an individual do to foster an inclusive work environment? First, examine your own attitudes, biases, and stereotypes toward different groups and replace them with an open mind. Be aware that once people hold a certain belief about a group, they tend to selectively notice characteristics that affirm that belief. So, if they believe that individuals from a certain background are lazy, they'll be unconsciously looking for proof that backs up their beliefs. Altering the stereotypes we hold requires a keen awareness of our beliefs. It's also important to recognize that humans tend to gravitate toward people who are similar to them. We tend to associate with people who are like ourselves. This can breed in-group favoritism, which leads to less favorable attitudes toward out-group members. 
monitor your own behavior to see if you're excluding anyone. For example, if most of your work group are men in their 30s and you go out to lunch regularly but never invite the 55-year-old woman in your group, then you're excluding someone. Learning more about other groups helps promote better understanding as well. Be curious about those different from you and give people the benefit of the doubt before passing judgment or assuming bad intent. Cross-cultural differences can be a significant barrier to effective communication and team cohesion. A study done by Harvard professor Roy Chua also showed that unresolved tensions among cross-cultural teams actually lowered creativity, even among those not directly experiencing a conflict. An awareness of cultural differences can help reduce negative judgments, misunderstandings, and miscommunication. Some common areas of difference include eye contact, personal space, physical contact, communication styles, collectivist versus individualist approach, and task versus relationship focus. Cultural norms for eye contact differ across cultures. In the United States and much of Europe, direct eye contact is expected when people are talking to each other. Absence of direct eye contact during a conversation is often interpreted as lack of interest, lack of confidence, or lack of forthrightness. In many Asian and Latin American countries, extended eye contact could be interpreted as confrontational. Latin Americans tend to prefer intermittent eye contact. In some cultures, direct eye contact is considered rude, particularly when communicating with someone who is higher in the workplace hierarchy. This is the case in Japan. The key message here is to avoid making judgments of others on the basis of eye contact. Cultures also differ in comfort levels with physical distance between individuals. A person from a South American country may be comfortable standing much closer to others and may be more likely to touch others than someone from the United States would. If an individual from a more high-touch culture touches someone in the United States, the touch can be misinterpreted as sexual, when that's likely not the case at all. People whom we perceive as standing too close to us can also be judged as pushy or intrusive when, in actuality, they're just behaving according to the cultural norms with which they were raised. Communication styles differ as well. In North and South America and most of Europe, silence in a conversation feels awkward, and individuals from those countries typically rush to try to fill the silence. In Japan, silence is not viewed as something to be avoided, It indicates good listening skills and reflection. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you have colleagues who are non-native English speakers, they may need a little extra time to consider their responses before speaking. The acceptability of disagreement also varies across cultures. In some cultures, such as France and Israel, openly expressing disagreement with others is just fine. In other countries, such as Thailand, direct disagreement that's not softened in some way can be perceived as an attack. Another cultural aspect relates to our orientation toward individualism or collectivism. With individualism, the focus is on the individual's needs and interests. Individuals are expected to take care of themselves. Individualism stresses the role of the patient in decision-making. On the other hand, with collectivism, the focus is on the group needs and interests. Individuals look after one another. There is an emphasis on consensus decision-making, and the family plays a large role in healthcare decisions. Another cultural difference that can create tension if misunderstood is the extent to which groups are task-oriented versus relationship-oriented. Some cultures place more emphasis on accomplishing the task at hand, while others consider long-term relationships to be more important than the particular task. This manifests in several ways. In a task-oriented culture, an individual's success tends to be measured by his or her accomplishments. Those with a task orientation tend to be more direct and like to get right to the point. A task-oriented American manager might send emails to colleagues that have no greeting and just include a bulleted list of what is needed from the person. A person from a relationship-oriented culture, such as Japan, may feel offended by this brusque approach. If you're from a task-oriented culture, be aware that you may need to spend additional time on communications with those from a relationship-oriented culture. If you're from a relationship-oriented culture, recognize that direct, task-oriented individuals don't mean any disrespect. 
Let's talk more specifically about the ways diversity issues can impact health care. A 2002 study conducted by the Institute of Medicine found that, quote, a consistent body of research demonstrates significant variation in the rates of medical procedures by race, even when insurance status, income, age, and severity of conditions are comparable. This research indicates that U.S. racial and ethnic minorities are less likely to receive even routine medical procedures and experience a lower quality of health services, end quote. In the same vein, a subsequent 2013 report by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, found that in the U.S., quote, life expectancy and other key health outcomes vary greatly by race, sex, socioeconomic status, and geographic location, unquote. We also know that cultures can, quote, influence patients' health beliefs, medical practices, attitudes towards medical care, and levels of trust, end quote. As such, culture can, quote, impact how health information is received, understood, and acted upon, end quote. Clinical barriers often occur when, quote, cultural differences are not adequately addressed, resulting in lower access and quality of care, end quote. One organizational strategy to address cultural differences and reduce health disparities is the promotion and development of cultural competency. Although there are many definitions for cultural competency, the National Quality Forum recently defined cultural competency as the, quote, ongoing capacity of healthcare systems, organizations, and professionals to provide for diverse patient populations high-quality care that is family and patient-centered and equitable, end quote. The National Quality Forum's definition emphasizes five key elements of cultural competency. Ongoing capacity includes the, quote, policies, learning processes, and structures by which organizations and individuals develop the attitudes, behaviors, and systems that are needed for effective cross-cultural interactions. High-quality care implies state-of-the-art care based on evidence-based clinical practices. Family-centeredness implies respecting the desire of culturally diverse groups to include their family members in health care decision-making. The care is patient-centered when clinicians treat each patient as an individual within the context of his or her care. This requires a partnership among clinicians, patients, and families to ensure that health care decisions take into account patients' preferences. End quote. According to the Institute of Medicine's equity aim, quote, quality of care should not differ because of socio-cultural factors, end quote. As of 2014, the Cornell University Yangtan Institute reports that more than 8% of the population from ages 18 to 64 reported a work limitation based on a disability. Examples include limitations on mobility, vision, or hearing. Note that the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Title I of ADA specifically bars discrimination against those who may require a reasonable accommodation in the workplace. The 2012 U.S. Department of Justice, or DOJ, Barrier-Free Healthcare Initiative reinforced the rights of those with disabilities in the healthcare system, stating that they, quote, will make sure that people with disabilities, especially those who are deaf or hard of hearing, have access to medical information provided to them in a manner that is understandable to them, end quote. This DOJ initiative also aims to, quote, aggregate the collective message that disability discrimination in health care is illegal and unacceptable, end quote. It's important for both ethical and legal reasons to understand disability etiquette, which is a set of guidelines for interacting appropriately with those with disabilities. Understanding disability etiquette can help promote comfortable and effective interactions with your colleagues who may require reasonable accommodations in order to succeed in the workplace. Appropriate and respectful demeanor with someone who is in a wheelchair includes sitting to talk to a person rather than standing. It also includes shaking an elbow or prosthesis when offered by someone who has physical challenges. Also, do not assume that a disabled person needs your help always offer assistance first before taking any action. Remember to treat all members of the organization as respected professionals, regardless of physical differences. 
You may also work with people who are deaf or hard of hearing. People who are hard of hearing rely on facial cues to interpret conversation, so remember to face toward the person and speak slightly slower than normal. It is a common misperception that deaf people can read lips. In truth, lip reading has only about 30 to 40 percent accuracy under the best conditions. Therefore, never rely solely on lip reading for important conversations. If someone is using an American Sign Language or ASL interpreter, face and speak to the person rather than the interpreter. Also, if someone has a speech impairment, don't hesitate to ask him or her to write down what is said if you don't understand. If you're planning to deliver a presentation and one of your coworkers is deaf, ask if he or she would like to have a sign language interpreter present during the presentation. If you're showing a video as part of a training or presentation, make sure that the video has closed captions and that the captions are more than 99% accurate. People who are blind or have low vision may require large print, screen readers, audio tape text, raised line text, or braille translations. All documents and websites should be made accessible for those who rely on screen readers. Although it's a good idea to provide alternative access when you know that there may be blind or low vision meeting attendees, you may not be aware of this need prior to a meeting. Therefore, it's a good idea to plan all presentations with accessibility in mind. This concludes Diversity Issues in Ethical and Diversity Issues Related to Communication and Customer Service. In summary, the increasing diversity of both the workforce and patients is impacting healthcare delivery. Diversity has many different dimensions. With effective leadership and management practices and the right organizational climate, a diverse workforce is highly beneficial to an organization. The first step in improving our effectiveness in diverse contexts is to understand the factors that may affect our interactions with those who differ from us. Stereotypes about certain groups and an exclusionary attitude toward those who are different can negatively impact a work group. A lack of understanding of cultural differences can lead to misunderstandings and miscommunication. Cultural competency is an organizational strategy that can be used to address cultural differences and reduce health disparities. Finally, disability etiquette is an important contributor to effective workplace communication.